overlooking the delta of the Kaveri at the point where its distributaries fan out. The city of Tanjavur in Tamil Nadu, South India, was a site of an extraordinary architectural experiment from 995 to 1010 CE when Rajaraja Chola commissioned the building of the great temple Rajarajeshwara, later known as Brihadishwara. While the earlier granite temples built by the Cholas seldom had as many as three tiers, the Vimana or sanctuary tower of Brihadishwara rises up to 15 tiers. At 60 meters, it towers six times higher than that of any Hindu temple built earlier. This design was to inspire later structures. At the same time, they were not restricted by it. The Vimana dominates the temple complexes at Gangai Konda Cholapuram, built by Rajaraja's son Rajendra I around 1025, and Dharasuram by Rajaraja Chola II in 1160. Yet Rajendra I confined the Vimana at Gangai Konda Cholapuram to 10 stories in order to refine its design. In the Airavateshwara temple at Dharasuram near Kumbakonam, the Vimana is a modest five stories. And much energy is invested in the sculptures which elaborate and innovate on the forms and stories of Shiva which had earlier been represented at Brihadishwara. These temples are to be experienced and understood at many levels simultaneously. The symbolism of the architecture, the relations between the central Shivalinga, sculptures of Shiva on the walls, and the bronzes carried out on festive processions, murals, song and dance, that in the different ways unfold the stories of gods and their devotees. Later dynasties, the Nayakas in the 16th and 17th centuries and the Marathas in the 18th and 19th centuries renovated the buildings at Brihadishwara and added their own. As practitioners and patrons of music and dance, they also did much to systematize the transmission of intangible cultural heritage. Unlike earlier Chola temples of the 9th and 10th centuries, Brihadishwara is surrounded by a wall and entered through a towered gopuram on the east which is in line with a Garbhagriha named Keralantaka. This gateway commemorates Rajaraja's victory over the king of Kerala. Rajaraja was reviving a design established by the Pallavas in the 8th century. In the Garbhagriha or inner sanctum is enshrined the Shivalinga. This is surrounded by an inner corridor which opens onto a vestibule and the Mandapa or rectangular courtyard. The symmetry of Brihadishwara is exceptional. The walled compound is an unusually elongated rectangle whose width is twice the height of the Vimana and which forms an almost perfect double square where the midpoint of the sanctum corresponds to the midpoint of the first square and the midpoint of the pavilion of Nandi with that of the second square. There is a second Gopuram higher than the first which the architect Pierre Pichard has said marks the inception of a design that was to define great temples like Chidambaram.
how more clearly to express the cosmic expansion of the temple, extending from enclosure to enclosure, with increasing distance and increasing height. Raja Raja adopted the title Raja Raja Shiva Pada Shekhara, he who bears Shiva's feet as his crown. He thus saw himself, in a sense, as the steward of Shiva, and he acted as the custodian of earlier forms of worship by gathering the hymns of the Nayanmar poets of the 6th to the 8th century into the canon that has since been known as the Tevaram. It is said that the manuscripts of these hymns lay rotting in a room in the Chidambaram temple which the priests would not open unless the Nayanmar saints themselves were present. So Raja Raja commissioned images of the saints to be crafted and brought these to Chidambaram. He promised the priests that the saints' words would henceforth resound through the temples of South India and employed 50 musicians to recite their hymns at Brihadishwara. The stories of the Nayanmar saints were also brought alive through sculptures and vivid murals at Brihadishwara, establishing a tradition later developed at Darasuram, where the 63 Nayanmar stand enshrined in a row. In this way, the Brihadishwara temple embodies a vital link in the evolution of traditions and with the city of Tanjavur that was created around it. It embodies Raja Raja having brought unto one state the areas ruled by Chalukyas in the north and the Pandyas and Cheras in the south, as well as Sri Lanka and the Maldives. Inscriptions celebrate his conquests, describing the luster of the pearls, one from the Pandya king. <laughs> Rajagesari Varmanaha, Tirumahal Gola, Perinilla Chelium, Taneke, Urimi Wundami, Manakola, Sandalu Sale, Kalamaru Suri, Benginadu, Kanga Vadium, Tadige Vadium, Rolamba Vadium, Kudamala in Adu, Kulla Mum, Kalinga Mum, Yendisei Vadara, Yida Mandala Mum, Rattavadi, Yadare Kamum, Tindiral Vendi, Sanda Gunda, Tandil Vadarum, Woodyul Yalam, Yandun, Tudida Havangum, Yande, Tediari, Kesubul, Ko Adake Seri Manmaran, Ki Rajaraja Devaki, Yand, Yirubatara Vadi, Nar, Yirubadina, Udaya, Ki Rajaraja Deva, Tanjaur, Koil in Ula, Yirumadi Sodan in Kide, Tirman Janasari, Danam, Chaydarala Virund, Pandia Kulas and Ivadanati. Sanja Ur Kutte, Sanja Ur, Nam Edis Picha Tiri Katari, Si Raja Raja Saramudayarke, Nam Gurutano, Akan Gurutano, Nam Pendigal Gurutano, Matrum Kurutar Gurutano. Inscriptions also reveal how this empire was governed. As Professor Champaka Lakshmi explains, the Cholas had been able to increase their revenues from agriculture by developing the river system for irrigation by being the first to set up a department to survey and assess land and by bringing more land under cultivation through grants to Brahmins and by ensuring the protection of trade routes. He not only built the temple but also brought in from various parts of, the, of his kingdom priests, dancers, musicians, other service groups, uh, instrument players and, and other uh, you know, 
even including accountants, tailors, and what have you, weavers, and so on, from various pastoralists who could supply ghee and other, uh, you know, milk products mm. to the temple. So, temple's importance, therefore, lies not only in its architectural evolution, but its focus, its its its, its uh, role as an integrative force for uh, agrarian expansion. Gradually it becomes the focus for urban development because traders come in, craftsmen come in and make use of the temple services and the people of the locality to trade in this area. Tanjau temple represents in every meaning of the term the pinnacle of Chola power but also the importance of the cultural development that took place along with the economic and social integration that was also being done with the help of the temple as an institution. So it's a very major institution. That is why it has an enduring importance in Indian history. Dr. Champaka Lakshmi discusses how the town of Tanjavur is unique in that it did not grow spontaneously but was implanted by the king to sustain the ritual and festive activity of the temple. The inner quarters of the city were reserved for priests and the administrative class. Professionals and the royal retinue lived in the outer streets. Rajaraja set up a system of grant and exchange through which the economy of his empire fed into that of the temple. For instance, Inscriptions record an interest-free loan to markets who were obliged to provide plantains to the temple. Inscriptions also name donors ranging from Rajaraja's spiritual teacher, Karuvur Devar, and the temple manager to merchants and musicians. In a symbolic sense too, Rajaraja represented the fulcrum of the temple's spiritual economy. The text emphasizes that you must maintain the, the uh, what you call uh, proportion of uh, construction. And this is taken from the main linga inside the sanctum. The upper part of the linga is the basic unit of uh, the entire temple, of the inner sanctum. The entrance, the images, the space, the enclosure, and every limb of the central uh, tower, the central uh, mandapa, the enclosure, everything is proportionate to the inner linga, uh, which in turn was designed from the um, middle finger of the Yajamana, that is Raja Raja. Indeed. Unlike Pallava temples which were built of sandstone, Brihadishwara is built of granite. Believed to have been ferried from quarries 45 kilometers away. According to the inscription there, uh, the king, the emperor says, that I, the emperor, he doesn't call himself as I, he calls himself as we, the emperor. I have built this temple, and this is called the Sri Vimana, the main tower, of stone in Sanju, and that's providing a foundation uh, information about this particular temple, when and how it was built. When it says it was built of stone, that particular Yuma, the main center, the, the king said that uh, I built it of uh, stone, katrali. Katrali means kal thali. Thali is temple. Kal thali means stone temple. So it means that from base to the finial, this temple was built of stone, which is called the Suddha type of architecture. That is, 
you use only one material for constructing the whole uh, vimala and in this case it was granite stone from base to the top if uh, you use uh, other materials also along with stone like wood or uh, plaster then it is called a mixed type misra type of temple but uh, the best form of uh, architecture or temple according to shastra is the pure shuddha type of temple so here being a chakravarti an emperor he has built his loftiest temple of single material that is uh, granite stone so that he mentions in the uh, inscription which is found on the base even the vimana the stone it is made of two stones almost more than 70 tons sitting at the top the temple is made of stones and its vimana is more than 210 feet high how the stone was fixed at the top is it's is a question now there are people having differences of opinion but the stone was lifted to this height inside the vimana the square platform is slowly getting transformed into a circular one the stone each course of the stone is being cobbled little by little and the interior view is quite marvelous the visual impact of the vimana has been described by pierre pichard first seen framed in the gateway its volume gradually emerges until at the southeast corner there appears the first view of the tower as a whole its base giving an upward thrust while above the pyramidal design leads the gaze up till it loses itself in the clouds the principles underlying the temple's architecture are based on the shaiva treatise makutagrama as explained by dr nagaswami This is a essential part of the architectural design because uh, when they do the puja you know they bring down the supreme power which has no direction no color no boundaries but this is made to come into existence by the tip of the stupa on top of the mala which acts as a dot once you put it down in a space with no direction then you bring into operation this directions 360 degrees are brought into a distance on top which we call the bindu the top on top of this stupa dr nagaswami described how the undulating architectural lines seek to bring down the supreme power down to bless devotees One of the few bronze images from the time of Raja Raja that survives is the image he consecrated of Adavallar on Nataraja. This is an Ulsa Murthy by the way in this particular sculpture but this could as well be an idol as you see in the Vrakadeshwara temple and this angle makes this there's a complete kind of a subtle kind of a sinuous movement starting from here it's a wavy movement if you look at it and here the way the neck and the head above are held strictly conforms to and in fact it is an extension of this same wavy movement upwards this is what we call the lola hasta also called the geja hasta and you have uh, varada mudra and you have the fire in one hand the damaru the typical characteristic instrument of shiva in the other to my mind i think uh, music and dance could have been very powerful vehicles of the of the of the bhakti newly i mean introduced bhakti ideology so this song and dance had a, i mean you know it had a kind of a, i mean uh, they placed the premium on these two expressions 
and here comes the Lord Himself, you know, at His uh, highest expression, you know, embodying the concept in in His own body, rather, in His own persona. In the passageway, on the upper floor of the sanctuary, is the first visual representation of the Nritya Karanas described in the Natya Shastra, Bharata's treatise on dance. The Karanas detail how the body should be flexed, limbs outspread, and hands and feet raised or stamped in different passages of movement. Bharatamani gives us enormous scope for exploring uh, the possibilities of human movements from the points of view of kinetics and also aesthetics. Hence, the grammar given in this work makes the Marga technique universal in appeal and beyond time and space in its value. The Karanas appear to belong to Akasha, the domain of Shiva, who is described as having created the multifarious forms of the cosmos out of his own body, just as a dancer spins form after form from her body. Despite its symbolic significance, such an ambitious Vimana meant that sometimes structural problems arose to which the architect had to improvise solutions leading to imperfect proportions. Pishand has shown that when Rajendra Chola chose to shift his capital to Gangai Konda Cholapuram to celebrate his victory over the northern territories, he chose to build a lower Vimana where individual stories are more clearly distinguished but also better integrated into the overall design which proceeds from square to circle in a supple line that contrasts to the steep, straight sides of Brihadishwara. Shaped like a chariot, the temple at Dharasuram has been seen as representative of the 12th century emphasis on ornamentation with its profusely sculpted pillars that show the influence of the Vaishala tradition from Karnataka. With multiple shrines, long corridors and various pillared halls, it is believed that temples of this period were designed specifically for festivals offering an abundance of narrative imagery to the audience of worshippers. This brief account cannot exhaust the iconographic wealth of the temples, the different manifestations of Shiva, as Dakshinamurti, Ardhanarishwara, and Bhikshatanamurti. From Nataraja to the dancing Shiva in Dharasuram, 
the figure of Tripurantaka in Brihadeshwara's murals, the moving scenes of Tara grieving over Bali's death, and the friendship of Appar and Sundarar, the auxiliary figures of Nandi, the Dikpalas, Dwarapalas, and the Yalis. Music and dance not only formed part of worship, they often celebrated the beauty of temples. The splendor of the dances at the monthly and annual utsavs of the temples are vividly described in literature, but it was the four brothers known as the Tanjur Quartet, Chinnaya, Ponnaya, Shivanandam and Vadivelu, who in the 19th century gave us the structure of a Bharatanatyam performance as we know it today. They didn't become musicians. Though they were musicians, they composed a lot of Varnas, Kirtanas, etc. They wanted to only to be Bharatanatyam, Nati Acharyas. So they started to train a number of Devadasis from Thiruvallur and Tanjavu. Many came, even from Andhra Pradesh, many came to learn from them. So they started to compose Alaripu, Jatiswaram, Shabdam, Varnam, Tilana, etc. That is the present reporter. They um, started in, in 18... 20 or 1836, which is in currency even today. So they devised the format. If it is to be called Bharatanatyam, this should be. In that way, there were plenty of Natronas who came and learned from the quartet and their relatives. So they started, so they diffused the light of Bharatanatyam. In that way, Tanjavur is very great. Music flourished at the courts of the Nayaka and Marathas. Vijay Raghava Nayaka composed Yakshagan and Shahaji wrote dance dramas in Telugu and Marathi. It was at Dragunath Nayaka's court that the Veena acquired its present form. His minister, Govinda Dikshitar wrote the treatise Sangita Sudha and Dikshitar's son Venkatamaki codified the parent scales of Carnatic music. The trinity of Carnatic music, Tyagaraja, Dikshitar and Shama Shastri, who lived in the late 18th and early 19th century and gave us the Kriti form as we know it today, were also associated with Tanjavur. Tyagaraja's Samadhi at Tiruvayaru is on the banks of the Kaveri. Lanes in Tanjavur are named after musicians. Villages evoke famous Nagaswaram players. Actually, Tanjavur guided the whole dance and music world for a period of few centuries. Today's 72 Melakarta scheme of Kannada music is from Tanjavu. Today's Veena is from Tanjavu. Regarding the instruments, apart from Veena, violin, violin was brought to Kannada music for by two people, one Baraswam Dishida and Badiweg of Tanjavu both. And there are two traditions of the three temples are UNESCO World Heritage Sites. The outstanding universal value they and the constellation of arts around them represent may be evoked by two figures. One is the king Achutapanayaka, who gave practical support to the Vidwans and artists 
seeking refuge in his kingdom after the Vijayanagara Empire fell, so that their legacy continues in the Bhagavata Mela at Melatur today. The other is Abraham Panditar, who in 1917 published the first important study of Tamil music. Both figures exemplify the openness to outside influences and the active custodianship of tradition that have made possible the arts of Tanjavur. And which is why the three are living temples today, not monuments to dynasties of the past. Thank you.